We're reconvening. Thank you so much for, for being quick and efficient. We are delighted for our first fireside chat. Um, and in order to introduce the participants, I'm going to uh, welcome Jennifer Erickson uh, to the podium. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, everyone, for being here. There are almost 115,000 Americans waiting for life-saving organ transplants, and many of them will die waiting, making this one of the most persistent and expensive health challenges of our time. Here to talk about how we actually solve it are two leaders in this space, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, and the co-chair of Arnold Ventures, which has led so much of the groundbreaking research here, Laura Arnold. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for letting me be part of this conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and first and foremost, I would love to thank the Secretary for all of your incredible work, not only in organ donation, but, uh, but truly as a pioneer of reform in so many areas that are so important uh, to healthcare pharmaceutical pricing, opioids being, a, being just a few of them. So, uh, so we are in the presence of, uh, of a true reformer, and we are appreciative of, um, of all that you do. But today, as Jennifer said, we're here to talk about organ donation, which is a critical, uh, a critical area, and one that really is so intuitive for so many of us in the field. It is, it is low-hanging fruit, so much to do. And it's an issue that the President and you, Secretary Azar, have decided to tackle head on uh, through an executive order by the President in July of 2019. And um, your department, HHS, of course, has taken strong action to implement those reforms. So um, I'd love to start the conversation by talking about why you feel this issue is so important and um, why does this resonate with you? Sure, um, and I'd start by you didn't ask this question, but I'll start with the first question, which is why is this so important to the president? Um, I don't actually know where his passion on organ transplantation comes from, uh, but it is very real. It, it, is, it is constant, it's very real. He's very personally focused on this. This isn't, this isn't just, you know, so often it could be something that a cabinet department presents, the president signs onto, et cetera. There's something very genuine and real here in terms of his passion and desire around organ, around organ procurement transplantation, and he's no, not explained to me where that comes from, but it's there. For me, I've got several layers of interest and passion around it. I mean, first, um, the core of why I want to be at HHS and love running the department is we have so many programs, and I'm really there to make programs run as best they can. This is one that doesn't run as best it can. It's a target-rich environment for improvement, uh, and so that gets my juices flowing. Uh, the second is, again, institutional. Uh, just if you take end-stage renal disease, uh, one out of five dollars that we spend in Medicare is related to the care of individuals suffering from kidney disease and their comorbidities. So it's just a massive area for improvement as we think about the program as well as outcomes for our patients. Third is personal uh, for me. Uh, my father uh, had end-stage renal disease. Uh, lost his kidneys and um, was the beneficiary of a directed living donor. Uh, but I got to see kidney care firsthand. I got to see center-based dialysis. I got to see the improvement than just the toil, the, 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 the turmoil that, it, that, that imposes, the disability it imposes, et cetera. I got to see the massive improvement in quality of life from peritoneal dialysis at home. I got to see the importance of living donors. I got to see how hard it is to be a living donor, and then got to see the miracle of a transplant. So a whole range of reasons why I care greatly about this. And of course, it makes a lot of sense that you're beginning your focus on, uh, on kidneys, because 80% of the waiting list for organ donations uh, is for kidneys. and this represents an enormous amount of resources for our, uh, for our government. Uh, you mentioned the $114 billion that we spend on, um, on kidney disease, which is more than many, many departments combined, including you know, NASA, 
you know, Department of Homeland Security, NIH, I mean, the, you know, the numbers, the numbers truly are massive. And of course, your initiative uh, deals with organ donation and it deals uh, with other areas of efficiency from scientific discovery to, uh, you know, to dialysis at home. You know, you are interested in, in reforming the entire pipeline of uh, kidney care so that we serve patients better, but also so that we serve, uh, you know, we save resources, which are, uh, you know, which, as I said, are enormous. So um, let's talk a bit about how, how the system works now. The system that you inherited, which is so deeply flawed, give us a sense of, um, of how it works and where you're seeing opportunities. So um, let me talk first about how the system works around kidney <coughs> disease, and then we can talk about organ procurement. Yep, Both sure, areas. yep. I mean, so with kidney disease, uh, right now, you get what you pay for. What do we pay for? We pay for people to get into end, in, into end stage renal disease, and we pay for people to get center based dialysis. So we get more of that. You get what you pay for. Um, the United States has 80% of our people on center based dialysis. Hong Kong has exactly the opposite. Guatemala has 50% of their people on home dialysis. But we pay for center based dialysis. So we aim to flip that. We aim to get 80% of our folks either in home dialysis or transplanted. Uh, we also um, don't reward physicians and clinicians and centers for keeping you from progressing with your chronic kidney disease. Well, we're going to start rewarding you for actually managing patients, early intervention, um, stopping and slowing the progression of kidney disease, and then we're going to fix organ procurement and transplantation so that we double the number of available kidneys for transplantation. So then we get into the infirmities of, our, of how we do organ procurement as well as transplantation. The single biggest issue right now is the entities that we have, the organ procurement organizations that contract with us uh, to run the system, uh, there's very little accountability. It's effectively a self-policed system. Um, it can, when it works, it can work amazingly well. A lot of it has to do with the leadership. You know, you can, you can actually see dramatic changes sometimes when just the leader moves from one OPO to another or a new leader at an OPO. You can see a dramatic change in available organs procured and transplanted and quality outcome. It's, it really makes a difference. So just to interrupt you for a moment, uh, so there's 58 organ procurement organizations in the country. They're divided geographically. What's supposed to happen is an eligible donor dies the OPO is contacted by the hospital, and it is tasked with procuring that organ and getting that organ to a transplant center. What's happening is they're not doing that. They're woefully inadequate. Some of them are. Some of them uh, have a, a success rate of something like one third. Even the you know the high performing ones, honestly, are not you know super high performing. They're, they maybe they have a you know a success rate of closer to 50% if you you know if you use somewhat reliable data. So so part of the issue is um, you know woeful underperformance in an environment that's you know that's quite difficult obviously this is you know no one is belittling the difficulty of dealing with people who are in bereavement who are uh, going through trauma but OPOs something is not functioning well in the way that OPOs are doing their job. You alluded to a few of those things. There's a management dysfunction. There's disorganization. There's you know, uh, we we have lots of anecdotal evidence of things that um, of isolated instances of things that have gone wrong. But part of the issue is we don't really know what the performance is, right? Because as you said, there's no oversight. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, it's like I said before. First, you get what you pay for, and you also get what you measure, and you don't get what you don't measure. And right now, the system basically is one of self-policing and self-accountability. Um, the organ procurement organizations <clears throat> are basically able to define what an available organ is. Uh, they're able to get credit for uh, procuring an organ but having it not be transplanted. And we aim to change all of that in the system with real accountability. So what are we doing? We're basically saying uh, every <coughs> organ from an individual 75 or under is an available organ. So just stop the gamesmanship. Stop the finickiness, stop being able to say, well, we don't really like that, or, or defining that if a rural hospital was a little too far to go to, um, that it was unavailable. Right, because they self-report, and so they exclude some of those numbers right. at their will from the denominator of, you know, so, so, that, their, you know, so that their percentages look higher. So yeah. now, 
hold accountable for all <laughs> genuinely available organs, 75 and under, except for certain, obviously, certain limited, limited categories that are not clinically, uh, um, clinically appropriate. Um, but then also reward only when actually transplanted. You see, <clears throat> you, you get into this practice right now where the OPO might procure an organ, but then it's, quote, wasted. I mean, it's ten, I think it's tens of thousands a year <clears throat> are actually, quote, wasted, um, in part because let's say you procure an organ and the center that you have the best relationship with the transplant center turns their nose up and it says, well, it's not exactly perfect. It's not just just so because they're worried about their own quality metrics on their own standing as a transplant provider and not having an organ failure or a surgery failure. But then interestingly, what you find with the better OPOs is they've got more of an outreach and they create better relationships with other transplant doctors and they might even go out of their network <clears throat> to, other, um, to other transplant surgeons say, I have this organ and you find more willingness to use them. And even creative tactics like the, that we've seen success where you might have a fairly difficult organ procurement for one reason, physiological reason or other, but if you get the transplant surgeon actually through telemedicine on camera can actually observe the procurement, the procedure to remove the organ and actually give guidance on that, it, you've just taken an organ that a surgeon may have turned their nose up at and converted that into a, an organ that the surgeon is not only willing to but committed to using in the transplantation. So you change the metrics, you hold them accountable. We, we've moved to, we've got the four-year cycle of recertification. We're going to move to annual cycles of that. It's all in our proposed rulemaking. Um, and just real accountability. If you're going to be an OPO, you're going to have to drive results. And if your leadership's not achieving it, you've got to get new leadership. Um, and we're going to monitor on this, this yearly basis. And that's going to be transparent measurement. So all the world will be able to hold you accountable for delivering on these outcomes. Right, so the, uh, so the strong message from uh, the Trump administration, from your rulemaking is the gig is over. You don't get to, you don't get to fabricate your own numbers. You don't get to exclude uh, certain, certain donors or certain potential donors from your denominator. You don't get to live in this environment where no, uh, no OPO had been decertified for decades, yeah. right, <laughs> or ever, <laughs> right, exactly. There was, yeah. you know, there was some noise about decertifying oil in New York. It actually wound up not happening. It's on a recovery plan. Uh, but under this new rubric, this all changes. And, There's and, a focus on performance. And, and, I, and I want to be clear, like I said before, there are OPOs that do a fantastic job, and there are OPO leaders that do a fantastic job. We want to raise the bar. We want to pull everybody up, figure out who's in that highest, the highest tier, and have everyone else be measured according to the highest tier and lift, lift them up to that level so that where you live does not dictate the availability of organs for you or the, or, 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 or the wait times. Right. One, of the, one of the arguments that some OPOs have made uh, in light of very vocal criticism recently uh, has been that, well, actually, no, if you, know, if you look at our numbers, our numbers have actually gone up. You know, we, we've actually facilitated more organ donations, more, more transplants. Uh, the wait list numbers have gone down. Of course, as you know, that sadly is because the opioid epidemic has resulted in more available organs. So it isn't, uh, it isn't a, an increase in performance of OPOs. It's, in fact, you know, an increase in availability of, um, uh, of donors. So we'll all have to ensure that the metric that is ultimately implemented considers that. Yeah, and because mm -hmm. um, you don't want just more absolute numbers, you want more as a percent of available organs actually being procured uh, and, and effectively transplanted. Let's turn for a moment to the issue of oversight. Uh, today, the, uh, in connection with this conference that, uh, that I'm so happy to be a part of, uh, leading thinkers, leading policy thinkers, have um, published a paper on some suggested policy initiatives and some, uh, um, some suggestions on moving forward on organ reform. And one of them was um, dealing with the issue of oversight of the entire system, highlighting the fact that it's somewhat segmented. You don't control every aspect of, of organ donation. Can you speak about um, potentially consolidating that authority under one department, under HHS or, or wherever it makes sense, so that some of the segmentation is taken away and there's a little bit more consistency in the oversight? So we, we've got several parts of our department, mainly HRSA and CMS, that play a major role, of course, in organ procurement and transplantation oversight. 
um, but they're still even more. Um, <clears throat> and we've pulled that together virtually. Uh, that's what we do at the department at the center is really we, it's, it's not unusual for us to have with our healthcare systems complexity and 330 programs at HHS and $1.3 trillion budget for us to have these overlapping or um, dispersed authorities. And we do, we are able to actually make that work. Um, I've heard about the proposals about consolidating authorities. I'm certainly open to that. Right now though, you'd be consolidating without the accountability. The number one priority is get this rule finalized. Here are the comments, get it finalized, refine it, get it out there um, and let that get to work. Um, we can always change organizational structures, reporting relationships, whatever to fit that, but that will actually make no difference if we don't have the regulation and the accountability of the organizations that actually have to drive the procurement and the transplantation. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, one other thing that we're, we're doing that we've talked a lot about procurement and transplantation, we haven't talked about living donors. That was my we next question. Donor, that is exactly where I was going. No, yeah. please go ahead. Well, go we ahead. Well, because coming there also. We've of course. Um, so uh, with living donors, right now it's very hard to be a living donor. You know, this is someone who's literally giving a piece of themselves to somebody else. We should be doing everything in our power to support that incredible act of generosity. And instead we do not. And so we have proposed to actually enhance the funding and services and, uh, that can be given to living donors to support them in their work, whether it's health care, travel, reimbursement, uh, lost time work, et cetera. Uh, so we're proposing that and look for comment on that also because we want to support living donors and their generosity. And currently, living donors are only reimbursed for their medical expenses. And as I understand it, they're only reimbursed if they meet a certain level of income yeah. eligibility, okay, which is 300%. That's right, 300% right. of federal and poverty level. Congressional funding <laughs> levels each year, whatever they come up with, right. So there, isn't a, so there isn't a whole lot of room for somebody who is very well intentioned, but who has some real expenses and real issues to deal with, whether they're child care or elder care or you know, wage loss or you know, people just things relating to life. Uh, and many, many people believe, and it sounds like you agree that that's a true impediment to uh, increasing the number of living donors. The paper that was published today notes that uh, removing some of these financial barriers to living donations can enable up to 1,600 more organs per year, which could translate into a savings of over a billion dollars um, over five years. So, so, I mean, so the dollars are real, and more importantly, the connection and the taking advantage of this incredible gift that someone is willing to give uh, seems like the right thing to do. Yeah, and, we're, and we're very open to all suggestions on that. We've asked for comment on that, including income levels, um, as well as the things beyond medical expense uh, reimbursement that we could open the door to under our statutory authorities to, to support living donors. Mm -hmm. Now, in the few minutes that we have left, I'd love to hear from you what you think as you think about implementation, the, the, the common process is, uh, is closing relatively quickly, so uh, I'm sure that your mind has already turned to implementation. What do you think will be the biggest challenges? And what do you think that the regulatory and you know, constituency community can do to make sure that these actually get implemented? So um, I'll, I'll be interested to see once the comment period closes, all the feedback that we get from the OPOs, the organ procurement organizations. But in my interactions with them, I think there's at least a sizable percent of the OPOs who, who get that there's a need for reform, get a need for accountability, and actually look forward to that. You, know, you, see, you see that those of us who lead large organizations see this with performance management also. Sometimes the most disaffected employees uh, are your highest performers who are mad that you aren't actually managing out or managing the performance of the lower performing colleagues of theirs because they feel they're both bearing the weight of their lack of performance or getting blamed for their lack of performance. So I've seen a real openness. I hope that comes through in the comment period um, because it's obviously easier for us to work together if there's a collaborative atmosphere on, 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 on addressing that. Um, that's going to be the key. The key is going to be the systems of accountability, um, audit, data, systems and accountability and getting that up and running. Uh, I wish it could happen tomorrow. It doesn't have government and regulation doesn't happen tomorrow. So it's a multi-year process in terms of the contracting cycle as well as the certification cycles with these organizations. So um, it's not as if all of a sudden the world changes tomorrow or 30 days after the rule becomes final. But 
we also have been living in this world a long time and then ch the foundations of change start and will be in place and basically be you know irreversible from that moment on so real hope on the way and i know that you all are acting with enormous sense of urgency. We know that a thousand people a month are taken off wait lists because they either died or because they're too sick to be transplanted. Uh, so the, the, the human cost of not getting this right is, is enormous, <laughs> especially in light of the fact that we know that there are solutions that can be implemented. Uh, Secretary Jar, why do you think that in this acrimonious political environment, this issue, is an issue that has received so much bipartisan support. We've seen legislative proposals, we've seen you know, members of Congress, senators, uh, uh, send, sending letters to you, to, to other oversight bodies. We've seen a lot of momentum. Of course, we've seen the leadership of President Trump, of you. Why do you think this, this is the moment? Well, I mean, without violating HIPAA, because we're not a healthcare provider um, right now, <laughs> how many people in this room have a relative, let's pick one area, have a relative impacted by chronic kidney disease. There you go, that's why. Um, when, when we did the kidney care announcement that the president rolled out, um, it was the biggest positive response we've seen in anything that we have done in healthcare because it touches so many people. I cannot tell you how many people at HHS or just out in the public or just in my regular private life came up saying, Thank God you're doing this. It's about time. Thank God you're doing this. Um, same to the president. And liberal, conservative, didn't matter. It's just, it's life. Um, people coming forward. Add in other areas of trans with, with transplant need. You just keep adding more and more people, regardless of politics, who see there's an issue, there's a problem, see that it's impactable, see that it can get fixed. Um, so that's why. And there's also a... Uh a true social justice component to this that, that transcends political parties, as you mentioned. Many of the people who are on wait lists, many of the individuals who are affected by this crisis are people who are in minority communities. Yeah, you have a and dis obviously a disproportionate uh, of, of impact on African Americans, Native Americans, and the Hispanic community, I believe, uh, in terms of chronic kidney disease and need for transplants. So I think that's another another aspect saying you have our traditionally underserved communities most disproportionately impacted by the dysfunction in the system mm -hmm. and also then obviously if we can make improvement disproportionately impacted by the benefits accrued from fixing it are you seeing um, are you seeing any forces of opposition I haven't yet um, listen uh, especially not on the transplant side we'll have OPOs we'll have issues I'm sure on the accountability you know, you know some people won't want to be held accountable there it is um, mm -hmm. On the kidney care side, I do think we're asking for some very major changes in how kidney care is done. Uh, that is disruptive of the status quo and financial arrangements, um, and that will change. Uh, and smart players will skate to where the puck is going, reform their systems, and, but it's hard. I mean, we're, just like you mentioned in your opening, um, we're challenging a lot of vested special interests in the healthcare system, I mean, really, top to bottom, we're <coughs> trying to people who've had a good gig going for a long time, your world is changing, you can be part of the future world, but you're gonna change. That kind of change is really hard. Um, you see that in you know the personal reactions to me, internal and external. I mean, <coughs> when you're taking on vested interests, they're not happy all the time. You see that if you're leading companies, when you make changes internally, change management is the hardest thing we do as leaders uh, to get people to understand what's that book, uh, you know, the, your iceberg is melting, you know, you're, you're, it's going away, you better figure out another one to get on to. Um, and that kind of change management is really difficult because there's a lot of money involved. I mean, no, that's right. you said $115 billion a year of money is sloshing around in Medicare related, related to this. But I've generally been... Compared to other areas where, that I've tackled and other special interests that I've tackled, um, I, have, I will say I have generally found the space of organs and kidney care to be more cooperative and more willing to recognize the world has to change than others. Well, the topic, uh, that's right. No, absolutely. Well, the, the, the topic of these discussions. <laughs> 
You, you, no comment. Yes. Well, yeah, I do have comments, but I'll save. I'll save. Uh, I'll save my editorial commentary. But uh, this uh, this conference, th this gathering is about is about innovation. It's about scientific innovation and policy opportunities to actually move things forward. This is uh, a prime example of an area that is already moving, where we have enormous promise to serve thousands and thousands of people. So we are grateful for your leadership and grateful for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.